Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? This is the Good Education Show. City. Good morning, Fini. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Good Morning Education Show. Good morning, Rosimi. Are you tired? Good morning, Fini. Ah, good morning, Gideon. Good morning to everyone that's listening out there. It's a fantastic Wednesday morning. All the way from Lagos, Nigeria. <laughs> good morning. This, good morning. This, they will say good morning, everyone. Titi, your energy doesn't have part two, man. Yes, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> good morning, guys. We're streaming from Abuja to Nigeria to West Africa to the entire world. And it's going to be a great time today because we are always having a great time on the show. So please tell someone to tell someone that Good Morning Education Show is on. And I also want to say good morning, internet, so that we don't have issues. <laughs> 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 Sometimes it's, it's, it, it can be funny um, when the internet decides to prove that it's a stakeholder on the show. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bigger stakeholder. <laughs> I'm telling you, just, <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we just, uh, well, apologies, we, we didn't start it on time, but then connectivity is here, we're here, we're live, and uh, it's great to be here. And as usual, we'd like to say good morning to our viewers, our friends, our tribe members, good morning to Gideon Essien, Gideon as has been absent for a while, but good morning. Thank you, Gideon. I said, Titi, say good morning to Gideon. Good morning, Gideon. <laughs> Rotima, are you there? See, hmm. are you there? Uh oh, is it my internet? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I, I, I guess uh, the internet hasn't gotten its good morning yet. It's about to get to it. <laughs> oh well, that's uh, good. Good. Good morning. How How are you today? What's happening at your end? Why we wait for Rotimi to join us? Um, I'm very well. I'm very well. And at my end. Well, um, getting on some some brain work, <laughs> putting together putting together some um, some items, some articles, launching a few things. Things are in the cooking pot and still on the burner. So, um, probably be making some announcements soon. Okay, that's that's awesome. How is the weather at your end? Um, oh, it's a sunny it's a sunny morning this morning and i'm actually i'm actually right now standing in um direct well i'm, I'm right under the sun what you probably call sun kiss and i'm enjoying the it's quite cool but sunny and uh, not very hot so it's a beautiful weather this morning okay that's cool Okay, Rotimi is back. Okay. Um, thank thank God we, we, we are pleased to internet, but internet is trying to show itself. So I would like us to start with something coming up. It's Global Money Week 2021, and I believe that it's going to be an exciting thing to hear from Titi herself to share with us what's happening this weekend, um, especially based on the event that uh, um, we have by Ninja Kids and uh, Kid Green Africa in collaboration with them. <laughs> yes, an access bank. All right, could you tell us yes, about it, please? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, you know, financial literacy is something that's so important. Um, usually it's not taught in schools. But when you grow up and see people make mistakes, then you know. Do you, I was I was reading some crazy statistics where it says that seventy percent of people that win the lottery go broke within three years. Can you imagine that? You know, seventy percent for what for one reason or the other. And then when you also look at some of the 
celebrities that you knew in the past that you knew made so much money. You're amazed that, you know, they go broke, uh, file for bankruptcy, even footballers that, you know, have earned big money. Then you're not here, you know, them living in, you know, in poverty. And it just shows that it's not enough to help your children gain the academics to earn money. You need to teach them about how to, you know, manage money. And that's really what Global Money Week is about. It's it's showing that the economy is so uh, much, is based on people being able to make good financial decisions. So that if you have financially illiterate politicians, they're going to have a country that's going to be bankrupt. That's just the truth. Um, if you don't help children make those decisions, uh, learn how to build those habits early, they're not going to be very uh, financially literate when they become adults. Um, it's estimated that by the time we are seven, our habits are already formed and we gain them from our parents. So if we find that our parents, you know, just spend, 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 we unknowingly pick up those habits. If our parents are into budgeting, making a list, we also pick up those habits. So it's important that we teach them early. And that's what Global Money Week is about. It's celebrated by 175 countries. It's a week long um, of activities, uh, um, usually in March. And this year we are collaborating with Access Bank and Kidney Printer. Uh, we're actually giving out a number of free um, financial literacy activity, fun activity books designed by Nigeria Kids. Um, and they were also having a free webinar. The free webinar is on Friday, uh, sorry, on Saturday at 11. The link is there. So you can just register your kids to attend, it's free. It's important that your kids learn about this thing about saving. I will, I always tell this funny story about my son. Um, I once he was born, I opened a savings account for him and started saving monies into it. I used to put a mon an amount for my salary every month. Whenever my salary got increased as well, I would just adjust. So one day I looked into the account and I was surprised to find that I had over a million naira in it. I then told this my son who went about telling people he was a millionaire. I didn't want to tell him that all that money did not belong to him. <laughs> but it just shows the power of savings, you know, that lead to um, make a mighty ocean, how you have to manage your expenses, you teach them early. And then, the, of course, the most important thing about saving is knowing how to invest and how to grow that money. So let them come and have fun. It's going to be a fun learning experience um, just for two hours on Saturday. Um, wherever you are, all over the country, you can just register and be part of it. Yes. Thank you, Rotimi. Back to you. Thank you so much. Um, that's a very good one, very important one. And if people are watching and for those who will catch the replay, please follow the link. It's on the screen right now. Um, Titi has said to register, we need to click on the link. So follow the link. I'll, I'll, I'll pretty much put it there intermittently throughout the show. So nobody misses out on this. This is something that is free. Um, well, it's it's free. Yeah? <laughs> it's at someone's cost. So uh, make sure you take advantage of this. And um, let's start that campaign that we want to build a culture of financially literate citizens. Um, and that will go a long way. Well done to Nigeria Kids. Well done to Access Bank. And of course, Kate Premier Africa. And uh, I think we'll also try to mention this before the end of the show um, so that people can be a part of this. And uh, on the Good Morning Education Show, we totally endorse this project and event. And we believe that it's something that is worth celebrating. Thank you so much, Titi, for this. Thank you. And God bless you. So now we're back to the news, to the news, to the news. Uh, we have some interesting news out there, and uh, we would like to start with Taos, Taswet, sorry, Taswet. Ta Taswet students protest against new medical fee. That's the news mm -hmm. from Taswet. Any statements, comments on that? Uh, okay, so what it is is that they've introduced a medical fee of 2000 naira by the management uh, and so the students are boycotting exams, which actually, which I mean, have started really because of the fees. Okay, I think the major thing is, you know, the fact that it was introduced without prior notice. Um, <laughs> you know, one thing about um, if you've been in business, 
you will know that and if you are a school owner or school administrator you know that when it comes to fees anything money generally you have to start telling people way ahead before you implement you can't, it can't just implement it um so you have to tell them what it is why you're doing it when it's going to be effective um for them to to be happy with it. even if something as small as 500 now you'd be amazed how parents will revolt i've been in pta meetings that oh boy it was like yeah it was like uh, the second world war <laughs> um and a lot of it like i've said is communication so you have to any, any fees they want to introduce in the new term, you find that from second term, they start the discussion, you know, um, letting parents know, having the meetings, let them know before they put it in the card. So I feel that, um, who knows, the, the, the medical fee might be justified because of all that's happening with COVID and all. Um, it's a lot of weight for schools to bear. So when my son was going to school this term, they insisted that we bring a lot of anti-malaria, they told us to bring it up, uh, multivitamins and all that. And I understood as a as a as a, um, a business owner, if there are spikes in anything, it might be too much cost for the school to bear beyond what they normally bear. So that's why they did some of that. So I think communication is key to carry people along. People are suffering. Honestly, this this is an answer. Yesterday, my sister and I were lamenting about the cost of meat, cost of pepper, <laughs> cost of everything that has gone up, you know, and. As, as well, I meant it. Ah, can you imagine? Gesha that was 200 is now 310. It can seem like a, a small thing, but all these things add up. So people are under a lot of financial burden. So, so that even a 500 naira increase can be a major one. You know, I still saw, I was in a group, they were still lamenting about 100 naira increase. So I think we should just be realize how pressure, financial pressure and burden people are under and try and carry them along in the communication. Absolutely, I agree with you. Um, hundred percent. Uh, communication is key, although at the tertiary level, sometimes communication is not viewed from an objective point. You know, we have unions, we have sometimes um, too many things, but we hope for the best for them. Welcome, Grace. Good morning. How are you today, Grace? Welcome to the show. Good morning, Grace. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Grace, you just woke up, right? No, I didn't just wake up. I've been <laughs> up and about. <laughs> All right. Um, experts taught course at Seplat Education Roundtable. That was from the Vanguard. Did you get you know, to I think, yeah, yeah, I, I think it's commendable. So, um, a total of uh, 143 um, teachers and inspectors from Odo and uh, um, Delta State have been trained by the uh, by um, Seplat. So I think this is a lot of what we are talking about. You know, um, a lot of corporates coming in to support to help education and for me it's always let's put it where there's the most impact and teachers will say it over and over again you know if you, if you help one student you help one student but if you help one teacher you're most likely helping 40 50 students so um teachers are one of the areas where we can experience the impact in education i always say you know um like one teach for nigeria does you know train up a teacher leader and you don't see the impact it can make in the school and in the community way much more than you know helping one student so that's not to say don't help students but i'm saying sometimes we need to hit um you know with, with limited resources where the impact will be the most so well done to them and thank you and we need more and more of this by various um corporates okay any any comments from um Fee? No, no further comments on that. All right. Okay, so we have the 34th convocation, Unical to honor innocent Ibitoe as 22 students bag first class.
Anything on that? Congrats to all the students. That's what I would say. <laughs> Always congrats um, to all the 22 people with their first class. And congrats to the people that they're also uh, um, honoring. You know, a lot of universities do that where they honor uh, prominent members who have helped in different fields and also contributed to the growth of of the school and um, the community. So, you know, congrats to everyone. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, we also need to move to the next one, which is Joy as Nigerian lady bags first class in law, shares a certificate and what she plans to do at law school. Any comments? Congrats, Joy. You know, good. Uh, I believe it's, you know, the Bible says to judge with those that are rejoicing. So we are um, And her name is Joy. This person, her family. So congrats to her. Um, and she hopes to repeat it in law school. So, so, so congrats to her. Honestly, congrats to her. And as I pray for success for you. Um, do it again. Congrats to her. Congrats. Well done for the great job. Uh, because when people excel, it's usually a a test of discipline. You know, and discipline and focus. That's really what it is. You know, being disciplined from the beginning. Because most of the back first class, that's what it is. While some of us were playing in year one and year two, they were focused. They knew what they knew what they came to school to do. <laughs> so they were focused from the beginning because. A first class is a test of consistency, you know, being consistent from the beginning. So congrats to her, well done, and we wish you all the best. All right, thank you. Um, we have ABU MSSN speak on alleged unfavorable lecture timetable for Muslim students. Um, when the Ilori, when we had the headline about the Ilori issue, this is one of the things we spoke about. That if we're not, if we don't take charge of what happens um, with our differences, then it will keep escalating and getting to. It, it may get out of hands before we know what is happening. So right here we have an entire higher institution, an entire tertiary institution, and um, religion is coming up to determine and to realign their timetable. I mean, being uh, whatever religion I practice, whatever creed I subscribe to, it shouldn't be that I I, um, I disturb other people or I make the world stop still for me because of that. Rather, I, I should be able to adjust myself to what the system and what the institution has run in as as a um, law and as rules so for me this is not even um, this is this is quite technical and tactical because we know how these things go um, if it's not properly handled in very in a very short while we hope it doesn't um, escalate to violence but really we, we need to begin to expose uh, our younger people in the education systems right from the very beginning how we how, how to tolerate other people's differences opinions and how we can we can align ourselves with the system i can imagine that this are uh, this is a federal institution it's not a private institution it's not um it's, it's not something that you, you you don't have the right to make to change the system and how it runs so it should be able to align to it what if they were to probably fly if any of these guys was to fly and it, it was during their prayer time or stop and would they ask that the, the plane stops for them to pray or that takeoff is delayed for them really we pamper some of these things too much and then it becomes too much of um of an interference it becomes too much of an issue 
for us to adequately deal with. I hope they're able to come to uh, a reasonable conclusion on this and that it's, it's um, not allowed to get out of hand. Mm -hmm. So much change. All right, so um, let's move to the next one, which says, young man who won medals as athlete in school celebrates back in his first degree and he shares his photos. Congratulations as well to that young man. Then Senate lecturers other react to discrimination against poly graduates. Tell FG what to do. Can we quickly take that? Okay, um, the discrimination against uh, pol the polytechnic education, um, monotechnic e education in the country has is is a long-standing one, and um, if that disparity is not quickly, because really, the the degrees are not superior to each other. The only thing is, well, I I decide to go into an institution to be more focused on a particular line or a particular skill, a particular um, Path of knowledge. It doesn't make me inferior to somebody who has um, a bachelor's degree from a university. This disparity, and it's been showing up in a lot of ways in workplaces. Some people are not even proud to say, oh, I went to um, a, uni a, a polytechnic because they feel like everybody's looking down on them. And if um, if the Senate is intervening in this, if lecturers are intervening in this, I'm not just talking about it but we're able to get to a point where it is clear to everybody that look, the path, of, uh, the, the path of education that each person follows is a matter of choice, it's a matter of training, it's a matter of expertise in their skills and in, their, in, in, in the path that they have chosen to take. It doesn't make them any less, it doesn't make their degree any less, it doesn't make their ability to function, it doesn't make their ability to contribute meaningfully any less then um, that would be awesome. I hope it's not just one of those times when it's another talk, 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 and at the end of the day, it's back in the folder and then they bring it up again. It's high time we actually look at this thing very objectively. Let's, let's bring an end to that discrimination and um, be able to move forward. It would be really awesome if the, if the federal government takes the lead in, in um, helping people see and um, uh, um, taking this discrimination off. It is really awesome to see that happen. So let's hope that their discussion and um, their reaction is actually profitable and fruitful. But you know, I, I want to take, I want to take um, different, a different but... perspective to it. You know, I, 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 because I, I'm always worried when people call, call discrimination, discrimination. But I found that, that I can discriminate against you for one reason or the other, but you can prove me wrong. You, you know, so I think it's also important that we, because this discrimination has been um, ongoing for a long time. Um, it's the same discrimination we had against state universities versus federal universities. But you know what? The state universities, a number of them have proven themselves to be at the par with the federal universities in terms of what they bring out. So we'll, people will continue to discriminate, you know, based on firsthand what they see. But if the people prove themselves wrong, then that discrimination, uh, it doesn't go away, but it slowly begins to fade. And the people that really want content will then go for it. It's the same thing about racism or, you know, tribalism. There will always be one thing or the other that we are discriminating against. Not to say that it is right, though. You know, I'm not advocating that it's right, but I'm saying that each and every one can go on to prove themselves, you know, can go on to prove themselves and, and show that despite the fact that, you know, they are from this, you know, they can still hold their own. And it's the same, I mean, I speak to, um, I speak to recruiters of, of um, in the corporate world and they discriminate against certain universities 
and they tell me why they say that you know what over time you sh- it has proven that consistently people from this and this universities are just better products so they've now started discriminating so this discrimination is not only against um you know polytechnic graduates it's against even some graduates from certain schools they won't take them because they've seen over time what the product has been like and i can say that personally as you know uh, someone that also recruits you find that consistently people from certain universities are consistently uh, produce better graduates than others so that's just um, the different view that where to come from <laughs> okay but do, don't you think that sometimes it's not really an element of what the university um actually did but the environment um where the university is hosted it's also a factor you know so <laughs> you can, yeah. i don't want to mention i don't want to mention names but there are lots of yeah. factors that, you're right you wrote to me i mean there are lots of factors that um determine the quality of, that eventually comes out but our role as you know school administrators educators continue to fight against those factors to go against the tide and still bring out uh, better graduates so it's just it's same and it's not just um, university that happens it's also in primary secondary school we're all you know of our environment but we can't do things as educators to help um, mini- minimize, is that the word? Minimize the impact of those other environmental factors. It's not, it's not to say it will be perfect though. Tochi says, don't you think that that is stereotyping? Well, everything starts with a stereotype. That's just the thing, that's just the thing. Men, women, um, it's, it's really the way we are. Um, Igbo, Hausa, Yoruba, we, we start with something. We start with what we know. Till we are, till it's proven otherwise, um, we 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 say that we go in objective, but most of the time it's not true. We all we all have one bias or the other. Um, the more educated we have um, in that direction, it helps to minimize the impact of our biases. But it, you know, it it, it comes up. That's why I say that in the end, it's for each individual, each school to prove to prove the stereotype wrong. That's 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 what but, but Titi, um, I'm I'm Titi. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's been a while. Um, oh, I apologize no, <laughs> for that. that. Too late to I know. Too late. Ah, no. sing it, sing it, sing it. <laughs> but Titi, you know, I I want to slightly disagree with Titi in a bit. Maybe I just heard heard the last later part of what Titi said. So forgive me, Titi, if I am um, you know disagreeing with you and not having the full context. But I think that what the, the lecturers and, and, and are basically calling for is a campaign and an advocacy of some sort. Because um, if, as an organization, you judge people based on, um, and I know this, the various levels of judgments that are being done, it starts out from when the person applies and you have seen the person's CV and there's a CV profiling, and immediately that CV is taken down because there's somebody else who comes from another university who's likely studied the same thing with that person. So that in itself is bad. It's already bad. And because why it's bad and it's highly discriminatory is because you have not given that person a chance. And for those of us who recruit widely, we do know that sometimes people who even have a second class lower degree have been majorly better than people who came up with even a first class, in some cases, and even people who came up with um, a second class offer. And these are supposed to segregate you along the lines of performance based on your knowledge acquisition or knowledge acquired. So for me, I think the campaign and advocacy is important in the right direction. I don't know how, I mean, I do understand, I understand to see your the, the idea of schools actually coming up to the table and providing the quality education that makes a majority of their students profiled to be high-performing people. But again, when we look at even just from a broad-based um, analogy of what our we're even churning out from all of the universities, um, it's not that different from the fact that you, you, you study something and then when you come into the workspace, it's a whole new ball game. That is on a separate conversation 
where curriculum does not meet work standards or work practice. And that is cutting across all, across all universities. So whilst the, 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 um, the advocacy is on and the campaign from the lecturers on this non-discriminatory um, uh, methods that, is, that, that ha applies, that affects their own students, I'm hoping that in addition that um, they're also looking in what's some of these uh, uh, things. I'm coming from an inclusive um, perspective. And so it's very, uh, I, I know that you need to give everybody a chance in the first place, because when you profile a CV and you haven't met with the person or even done the first preliminary call, which a lot of workspaces don't do, when you profile CVs, at least what you should do is put a call through that person. That's what your HR department is supposed to do before the, before death um, that particular CV. So I'm not sure if I missed out the earlier part of what no. you said, but yeah, this, this is just like my early thought, my, my own yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you know, Roger, you're an inclusive um, um, advocate, which is fine. We need, we need more of you. <laughs> you know, uh, we need more of you against me, a realist uh, advocate. So I hear you and I agree, honestly. Titi, I'm a realist. No, no, oh, no, believe no, me. me. No, no, let me tell you what I... I'm saying. Is that <laughs> I know, I know you're a realist. But what I'm saying is that. You know, when an HR department only made of two people, there's a you push for one row, a million people, a million people apply. <laughs> uh, you yeah, but to, Titi, but don't you think that you have also in that space, in the same space, and I understand what you're doing, but don't you think that in the same space you've also likely taken somebody who's more qualified or taken someone who's less qualified just by jettisoning a CV? You see, some people get into particular universities not because that's their choice, but because that's what mm -hmm. they can afford. You know, yeah, so yeah. sometimes, yeah, that, that, that's for me. You know, and again, when I'm talking about workspaces, what, um, the, the curriculum meeting work uh, skills, I'm also talking about even the so-called schools, the schools that we uh, necessarily just profile and say they are good. The reason why they are good is because most of them, um, sometimes they, they attach, there's this work experience that's been attached to the, the period when the, the, those students are in school. And sometimes mm -hmm. some children, some students on their own go ahead to do more for themselves. I currently work with somebody who, whilst they were in university, he studied um, something in agricultural studies, something around that. But he knew immediately that that was not going to, he, he said so by himself, but he said he knew it wasn't going to take him for that. So whilst we're in university, he did a lot. He, did, he took multiple courses. He, he, started, he learned two languages. He also went into HR and was taking courses for HR away from his school work. And that's, where, that's what led him into the world of work where he first interned as HR, as an HR associate and then grew up. And now he's an HR manager and his first few jobs. So, yeah, these are the things we want to, you know, start to campaign for in the education space and for schools to begin to think about it. But I, it's not, not to say I don't agree with you in, in, that, in this context that you have spoken from. You know, like there's this volume of applications and you're, and you, for God's sake, please, I beg, you're just prone to the ones that you don't want to have any. So I get it. <laughs> but my worry there, it's true, I get But my worry is that could you have just missed out someone who is actually more competent? That's just my yeah. worry. I, 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 let, let, let's not derail today's water, but we, we need more jobs. I think that's that will just. <laughs> we need more I jobs. agree. I totally because agree. All these, all these plenty of people trying to fit into this small bottle, this what's costing all this. We need more jobs. We need more people, more successful businesses, creating more jobs for people. Rosie, back to you and today's topic. <laughs> Thank you. Rosa, it's always good to have you, Jerry. Well, welcome. Thank you, Titi. <laughs> <laughs> so so has started... blessed our 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 uh, the pupils in um in our bridge uh, schools uh, with uh, financial literacy activity books. You need to see them; they're wonderful. We need to congratulate Titi and Ninja Kids for this great work they've done. Titi, you and your team need to be celebrated. Well done on Global Money Week, and I've registered yeah. my kids for that wonderful Zoom that Zoom um conference that's going to happen so everyone listening you better find that link you better the get your kids registered right to register you get click that. on bitly absolutely you money week lay your hands lay your hands on that activity work with my girls are going to be diving into it like throughout this week and we're going to complete it Titi, I, you know what my girls did they just flipped to the back to look for the answer key i'm like are you for real I 
I'm going to staple the staple. <laughs> so tips for you guys: staple the <laughs> staple it because kids are so crazy. They saw it. I didn't even see it. So yeah, I'm going to staple it away from them. Okay. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank so, you so much. Thank you. And um, you know, looking at what we just had as a conversation from the news. I think it's also addressing the conversation for the day, which is schools on crutches. Um, we all know that um, school support, school development, school improvement evolves around um, the concept of um, enabling the school, getting the school to be up and proper, getting the school to be able to perform as they ought to. But then we find out that it's like, um, it's now almost like a new reality that schools are now really stuck on their crutches, right? Um, crutches are working aids in some may, in some way of introduction. There's some support system that actually help temporarily for someone who is rightly in need of that. And um, But then when you now begin to realize that a lot of people are going to the things that were interim support or the things that were meant to be support for another, um, and then they now turn it into their own reality. That's something we need to talk about today. Um, I, I recall growing up as well, you know, I used to see some people holding walking sticks. And, you know, anytime I, I look at that, I, it caught my fancy like, oh, it was fashionable. But the truth about it is walking stick is not necessarily fashion. Um, accessory person in terms of aiding their work and so when you look at it from the other angle it's it's something that you also need to you know integrate into reality of today's schools and that's where we'd like to talk let them spend time to talk about and i think i'll start with rhoda um do you think schools are on crutches using my context and introduction if yes um um, should that be a norm? Should that be a reality? How long should the support system or should the support intervention stay as a support intervention? Over to you, Rhoda. Okay, me, why did you put me on the spot? <laughs> so, I mean, with the context um, in which you've spoken, I don't think all schools, I mean, anyway, I know that there's no, there's not never a situation of um, all. Um, it's a generalized statement I'll be making. And so when I use all, so pardon me, because I know that there will be exceptions. But uh, speaking from a, a Nigerian uh, perspective, we, we are, um, to be honest, evolving still um, to understand really what um, uh, schooling is. Because there's a, there's a separate um, the conversation, there's a separate conversation around schooling versus education. Um, and, and so that that's a long uh, discourse. Uh, but um, when the, with respect to um, whether the sc schools are actually working and standing on their own, uh, so, so what, what activates in my brain uh, with respect to crutches is needing support. And um, that support means that the uh, schools actually need um, to, uh, uh, are not yet functioning at um, a pace where they are, uh, a, a pace or a place where they can uh, stand on their own. And, um, and what that means is could go into uh, as, as much as the academics uh, side of things, as much as uh, admin, administration side of things, as much as innovation side of things. I, I, just from my experience of working in education and currently in the capacity I work, for, work in, um, we have within education so many departments. And, and that's something that I am, I'm finding is kind of absent in many of our schools. And so when you say, what is the part of the, what is the department that is catering for uh, innovation in itself? How, how are we innovating? Is there a department that is focused on looking at uh, experiments that work for, uh, or piloting experiments that, uh, that try to test a new idea or a new um, uh, practice that, that, you, that, you, that we know likely works in other contexts? So I've heard quite a number of people talk about the Finland. But every time I, deep, I do a deep dive into Finland, I realize that it's actually non-contextual for us uh, because even just the teacher base of Finland tells you quite a lot that uh, we will never be 
uh, able to get to that place. Uh, and it's really not our context. And it doesn't mean that uh, because we can't get to that place, that uh, there's excellence is redefined or that we are, we are, we are sub or par, sub par excellence, so to speak. So, um, yeah, do we need a lot of uh, schools uh, on coaches? Do we, do we still need support? Uh, schools do need quite a number of support because when I think of or oh, how do we assess children? How do we, uh, uh, what's the instructional methodology in our schools? Is it really preparing our children for the world of work? I, I, it can, it's not a straight answer. That, it's not an answer that you can say straight yes to. And in that case, uh, yes, uh, schools are on coaches. Thank you so much. Um, Titi, I'd like to hear your thoughts and what can be done based oh. on your response. What happened to the grace and fee? <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> yeah. It's a good question. I, I, yeah, I wanted them to talk before since I've spoken a lot today. <laughs> um, you know, like Rhoda said, people are on crutches for different things. So it's how do we help them? Um, for some schools, especially coming from the pandemic, their crutches are financially related. And one of the things that, um, even though education is a human right, for a lot of people, their schools are businesses, which means that, you know, they need to have sound financial um, uh, management. So that's, and that's one area that when I came into education, I found shocking that a lot of the school owners, passionate educators, but are missing it in terms of what is required to balance the books. And the balancing of the books are really what um, keeps the business running. <laughs> so I think that's one area when I look at schools uh, that they need to do. I was excited when I listened to um, uh, Mrs. Ajala. Yes, I think it was at one of her sessions where she talked about various things that schools could do to just keep the boat afloat in terms of from, from a financial perspective. So that's one area that I'm, I'm always like, very passionate about when I talk to educators, especially school owners, in terms of how they manage it in, from a financial perspective. And it's interesting that this is Global Money Week, because for some people, they're not keeping an eye on the books. They're not keeping an eye on their expenses, the inflows, um, uh, you know, parents' payment. And they find at the end of the day that then leads to a number of problems. It leads to a number of problems of one maintenance of the school. It leads to a number of problems in terms of paying teachers um, fees on time or regularly. And then you then lose those good hands. So it then becomes a vicious cycle. So one, one area you know, I would really want schools to learn is how to balance the books, you know, financial management. And that's why even when I talk about you know, uh, public schools, you know, the university, I'm always saying that they need to increasingly look for how to get other sources of income, um, not be 100% reliant on the government. That's really the way we need to go. Not to say that the government doesn't have a responsibility um, uh, to ensure that, you know, at least basic education is affordable and all everyone can partake. But the reality on ground, especially for the private school, low-cost schools, is you need financial education. You need someone that has a very good grasp of that in your uh, management team to ensure that the school continues to be um, a going concern. Let, let me add to what it is said. So in the fact that let me quickly add to what it is said. The fact that I mean, we need to congratulate schools who have made it through uh, the pandemic. And, and it's not as it definitely hasn't been a, a, a simple thing from innovating on assessments or to instructional methodology to innovating on how to keep the books uh, balanced to innovating on keeping staff um, because at this time it was quite tough to either keep or um, uh, allow them to find other sources of income to innovating on even just what's, what what um, is the way that children can learn best in a time that has become a, a bit polarized uh, people could access learning from almost any place. So um, we need to congratulate schools that are standing, and uh, even though they're on crutches. The point, the point is that, that once you're on crutches, you, are, you, you can walk, and then you can move from one place to another. Uh, that, that doesn't say that you are totally bad. The point is, as long as people are together and getting any form of education, that's something also to, to be excited about. Um, can we actually be in the process uh, of, of, 
of, of growth, yes. They say that the enemy of uh, progress is perfection. So um, we, we just congratulate the schools that are doing well, but um, the, the schools should be in that, um, have that department that constantly looks out for innovation, uh, have that innovation department. That's something that is missing. Somebody who, whose primary duty is to innovate on every aspect of, of, of the school. Mm. Mm. That's that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Rhoda. Um, and um, I, I love the comments. That let me just read one of the comments that we we have um, from one of our viewers. Um, Olushola Olumide says yes. Support is necessary for those who need one, but then the feeding bottle shouldn't be perpetuated. Meaning. The school being supported should go into independence, which actually speaks of the growth uh, levels that we have. Um, of course, you know that there are three levels of growth. And I'd like us to really touch on that before we end the show, which is talking about there's a level of dependence, there's a level of independence, and there's a level of interdependence. Um, for me, I think that. Um, I, I don't really see so many people get into that third level of growth where they are now demonstrating interdependence, not because they can't do everything, but because they've disabled themselves from being totalitarian and unilateral in nature. So you have people who create a system to actually interdepend on people as opposed to being dependent fully or independently, which are two extremes. What are your thoughts on that, Rhoda? And then we'll come back to Titi. I think I cut out for a bit, so I didn't quite catch. OK, so I was speaking about the comment from Odushola, who was speaking about um, the fact that, yes, some people need to also know that um, the crutches and the support should not be like in perpetuity. That there should be some level of, you know, there should be a level of dependence, independence, of, so, so to speak, that they must have. But then I also feel that in looking at that scenario, um, we need to talk about the levels of growth. And the levels of growth, the three most important levels of growth is the fact that there's a level where you are dependent totally on crutches at the level where you are independent and there's a level of interdependence. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think it's still in the world of what I, I talked about, having that department that is focused on growth. And and, 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 and for me, that is the department that I call the innovation department. You know, and then that's, that department just basically helps to do the levels. Where are we? Are we independent? Are we at dependence level? Are we at the independent level? Are we at interdependence? You know, and I think that's uh, where you really want everyone to be is that, you know, that there's, a, there's an ecosystem within the school that allows every department to function on its own and with each other. Uh, on its own, in the sense that you know, one, when a department has to rely on another department to succeed, um, sometimes that's where the the the, 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 the clash comes. I recall one time when I had to do partner with a, a separate department to move uh, a project forward, and, and this was a project of scholarships. And when uh, and that when no one really owned it because it's a partnership when no one really owned it, but no no department separate department was assigned to it but everybody knew that it was a goal it was a, it was, a it was an organizational goal that project never uh, met its goal if we were supposed to be at 100 percent uh at a specific figure we we, uh, we could only attain 50 percent moving that depart that project forward in the next year we were beyond in fact we, were, we met at 100 percent and we could even outflow so that's something that um you know, just figuring out the, the, the various levels, uh, knowing what uh, what steps to take from level uh, independence um, to level dependence is key. And using and project managing 
that 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 uh, movement from one level to another is very key. So it's basically just you know having that department and project managing well and assigning duties and making sure that um, the departments function uh, on their own and um, but of course with uh, each other. Right. Thank you so much. And Titi, please could you to could you also um talk about um that reality as well? <laughs> Oh, you know, the reality is the reality of the cycle of life. That's that's really what it is. We start out as babies, fully dependent, then slightly, slightly. And as parents, you know, raising children, that's that's the what we are what 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 our goals are to raise independent children. So it's the same thing with the school. You start out, the funds are given by you know the people that help set up the school. And slowly, slowly, the plan is that one day you will be self-sustaining. So it's, it's, it's a cycle of life. Um, what I'll just say is that for schools and educators, that as they're going through the cycle of life, what makes it easier is when you have a guide, like your parents, helping you, guiding you along the line. So if you're not there and you're at a different stage, um, you're, you're at the pre-independent stage, then know that you need someone to guide you and help you through the process. Um, so <laughs> I think it's here that I advocate for getting um, getting a mentor, getting a coach, getting educated. You know, I um, I I was listening to someone that was doing all these school leadership uh, programs, webinars, conferences. I thought they were just I thought it was fantastic. It's always good to listen to other people that have gone through it. Um, yes, so School Compass. Uh, I was at the event yesterday where they were organizing how to recruit the right people. You, you just need to have people handhold you, people that have done it, people that can tell you, this is what I did, this is the mistakes I made, and this is what we did to overcome it. So if you're at whatever stage you're at, if you're not yet there where you're independent, then you just need to get help along the way um, from other people that have gone gone that journey and made a success out of it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm afraid this is almost all that we could take today. Um, we had internet issues starting, but we are meant to stop at nine. We're six minutes past nine, and um, those 55 minutes on the show, uh, I'd like you to just give your your parting shots, Rhoda and then Titi on the conversation of today. Yeah, um, I mean, thanks uh, for bringing me on today. <laughs> I thought I was the prodigal child. <laughs> anyway, um, so, but um, yeah, today's conversation has really been um, all about, you know, sort of like, I see it more up in the world of uh, what support uh, schools can get. And like Titi uh, said, um, you know, reaching out for mentorship for co mentors or coach uh, or coaches or you know handhold uh, you as a school as an institution um, is key. Sometimes um, when we are so enveloped in ourselves, we we definitely are unable to think beyond where our, our scope is, and this is the role that consultants play help to play. You know, they see big picture. Uh, and with big picture, they help in hindsight to help you to uh, map back to where you are and then help you create those steps uh, that you take forward. So like this also I said. Well, I think <laughs> brothers. <clears throat> oh, so I, I, I will end with, um, you, don't, you, you don't have to remain where you are now. So if you're on crutches, it's it's fine. You don't have to remain. So you have to say what do you need. Uh, Rhoda is back. Oh, Rhoda is back. <laughs> Rhoda is back. <laughs> See, <laughs> today Rhoda, for me. Ah. Yes, yes, I am. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah, I was saying that that as Titi said, you know, like uh, we started out as a baby. I don't know what the last thing, but I, I was saying that as Titi said you started out as a baby and then you keep going and growing. And then should I think what I always say to everybody, be, let your default be uh, one of a growth that you are constantly in a growth uh, motion. Once you see a new institution that uh, to be honest uh, innovation happens uh, easily because you are open uh, the growth mindset has uh, set in 
and, and always remember the enemy of progress is perfection. Everything doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you're doing enough uh, already by providing a, a form of education to the world, and that counts for something. Thank you so much. The enemy of progress is perfection. Thank you, Wilder. Yeah. Kitty? Uh, yes. So I think Rhoda has even said what I want to say, to say that you don't, you don't have to remain where you are. Um, so it's just to, if you start and you're a baby, then move to the next level. If you're on crutches, you know, you know move to the next level. Um, so that's really my encouragement to everyone here. You don't have to remain where you are. Constantly aim to grow, to improve, to move to the next level. I like that. Constantly, constantly um, aim to improve. That's um, from Titi. So I'm afraid that's all we can take for today. It's been a great time on the show. Always a great time on the show. And that's why we end with our mantra that it's always a great morning and a good morning education show. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will be here tomorrow, same time, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., to speak about something important. We'll be talking about the faith, the face of faith tomorrow. Where does the role and the place of faith come in in terms of developing the education model system and sector? Please do not go away. Tell other people to be a part of it. It's going to be a great time together. And we'll end the show this week with a fantastic topic and um, which is talking about raising student billionaires i'm sure that it's going to align with the money week and it's going to align with the weekend so um, weekend program remember the, the link on the screen right now i want you guys to go out there copy the link share it to everyone to be a part of the global money week 2021 put together by our own, our very own Niger kids in collaboration with Access Bank and um, I think it's Bring Africa. Um, it's something that every school should be a part of. So if you know a school, um, I think parents can be a part of it too. Titi, what are parents yeah. need to be a part of it? Well, it's really for the children, but anybody can learn. You never know what you can pick up when you sit, when you sit and listen, but really for the children. Yeah, okay, it's really for the children. So you can send the yeah. parents to register. Okay, fantastic. So please, you've heard it from Titi. Please ensure you tell everyone out there to be a part of it. It's happening this weekend. Please ensure that you're a part of it. Saturday, the 27th of March, 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please be a part of it. We'll talk about this again tomorrow. We'll talk about this on Friday so that everyone can be a part of this fantastic experience. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful time. And I'm going to ask Titi to take us out of the show with our usual charge and word to you out there. Titi, over to you. It's always a great, fabulous, awesome, fantastic, wonderful, great morning on the Good Morning, the good morning Education Show. Have Bye, a great day. Everyone. Take care. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>